we all have valuable information that's trapped in a static analog format. Whether it's a book on a shelf or whether it's photographs that we have, maybe it's pieces of paper, envelopes, artwork. We often want the information contained in those objects as part of a collection phase when we're conducting research and studying, but it's trapped in that static format. And the challenge is that you can't quickly search a physical textbook and you can't ask AI to explain a diagram if that diagram isn't in a digital format, if it's in a handout. We need to have a way to digitize this information so we can bring it into our teaching, learning, research workflow. So in this video, I'm going to show you the four types of scanning hardware that I use to bridge the gap between the physical world and my digital brain. So you can search, organize, apply AI to everything that you're learning. And as a bonus, at the end of the video, I'll also show you how you can capture your thoughts on paper, but generate digital notes at the same time. It's important to note that this type of digitization isn't just about creating digital copies of something. It's about making the information useful for research, for teaching, for learning. And it's also important to note that this type of digitization often falls under fair dealing laws or fair use if you're down in the United States. You can check the laws where you live and you can ask a librarian or if your school has a copyright office, you can check with them. But this type of digitization is used for the purposes of research and education so that you can unlock the data that's in those physical objects. We'll take a look at a number of different use cases in this video, but let's start with high fidelity, high quality scanning, where we're wanting to scan photos, art, historical documents, anything where visual fidelity is very important. Maybe I want to take a historical document. I don't want to handle that document too much, but I want to be able to look at things like signatures or writing or postal marks in the case of stamps and stamp collecting. Anything where I need very high quality is going to lead me in the direction of a dedicated flatbed scanner. You can get some high-end printer scanner combos, but you do want to be careful about consumer level printer scanner combos. Often you don't get a high fidelity scanner with them. You get a serviceable scanner, but again, it's a flatbed scanner. That also is one of the biggest challenges is that any objects that I'm putting into that scanner have to be flat. So it's great for documents. It's great for things like artwork, anything that's on a flat surface. But if I want to scan anything that has some thickness to it, like a book, we'll look at those a little bit later. So the flatbed scanner will allow me to get very high resolution. I have an HP 8300. It's a fairly old scanner, but it does give me 2400 DPI or dots per inch. It's a very useful scanner for when I need to get really, really high quality scanning. That's going to allow me to see the object zoomed in at, at high, high fidelity. Now, not all scanners are considered equal when it comes to flatbed scanners. You're really looking at something that has good optics and can give you a high dot per inch or DPI rating. As an example, my HP ScanJet 8300 can go up to 2400 DPI, which is really good for what I'm doing. And here's a bit of a trick. My HP ScanJet 8300 is no longer supported by HP. They do not have software for a modern operating system, either my Mac or my Windows operating system. So you're wondering, how can I use it as a scanner? Well, I have third-party software that I use in order to run the scanner. And what this means is that there are companies out there who may have these scanners and they'll no longer be able to get the software from HP. They don't realize that they could buy a third party piece of software that would allow them to continue to use the scanner. So they'll often sell these scanners at a pretty significant discount. I've seen these scanners go on eBay for a couple hundred dollars, whereas brand new, they were like $1,600 to $2,000. So keep your eye out if you ever see any flatbed scanners that are high quality, have good DPI being sold either on Facebook Marketplace or through a company getting rid of them, or if you know somebody with a company that's getting rid of them, you might just be able to pick up a very high quality scanner at a very good price. 
But what if you have something like an entire book that you need to work with? Maybe it's a fairly thick book like a textbook and it's not going to fit on a flatbed scanner very easily. Plus it would take a lot of time to flip a page, put it on the scanner, take it off, flip a page, put it on a scanner. It could take quite some time. Well, I've made videos here on this channel where I talk about something called a book scanner. What a book scanner allows me to do is to have a scanner on a stand, flip through the pages of the book and capture a book very quickly. Typically under 10 minutes for a book that's 300 to 400 pages, you're flipping through the book and instantly capturing two pages at a time with the scanners that I've, I've demonstrated in another video. I use uh, something called a Caesar scanner, CZUR book scanners. And like I say, I've made an entire video. I'll make sure to link that down below on the different types of scanners they have. But what a book scanner will allow me to do is quickly scan in an entire book. It'll have lower resolution than a flatbed scanner, but it's perfect for doing optical character recognition on there. It's, it's perfect for creating a document like a PDF that you're going to be able to read and search. So that becomes a very valuable tool. You can use the book scanners in order to scan other objects. So for example, I will use my book scanner to do things like uh, scan stamps if I'm building a stamp album. I collect stamps. So if I'm doing building of a stamp album where I want to put the original stamps onto pages but I want to create pages for placeholders, I might scan or use a book scanner in order to, to do work with those. So there's lots of ways that I can work with a book scanner. I can even use it to visualize objects in a classroom. For example, if I want to project it onto a board. But for a research flow or for a digitization flow, what it allows me to do is quickly scan a book so that I can have a digital copy that I can begin working with. It's fast, it's easy to set up and easy to use. And there's different book scanners depending on how much scanning you want to do and how, how often you're going to do this type of work. There's ones that are faster, higher resolution. I'll link to the video where I describe them down below. Now, what if you just want to scan one thing? You have one document or you have one piece of paper or you have a whiteboard that you want to scan. If you're in a conference, you can use the scanner that you have in your pocket, your phone. So you can just snap a photo. That's a way of grabbing the image that you have. And you can take that image, put it into AI, and then whether it's ChatGPT or Gemini, whatever it might be, and you can have immediate analysis of what you have. So you can ask it questions about the object. You can ask it to convert that object into text. It's very handy. Now, I certainly wouldn't want to use my phone to scan a 200 page book. That would be very time consuming. And I wouldn't want to use my phone if I need a super high fidelity scan, but this phone is handy. It's with me. And by using the camera on the phone, I can scan all sorts of different objects. One of the nice things about using your phone to capture a whiteboard or a page in a book is that it's immediately available to your note taking system. Whether you're an Obsidian user, Notion, OneNote, whatever you use for reference, check out my video on a tool called Scrintle, which is a fantastic system that I like to use. And you can immediately put that object that you've taken a picture of into your research system. But what if you don't need high fidelity? You don't need an entire book. You don't even need a page from a book. You just want a line from a book, a quotation from a book, a specific element from a book. Well, in that case, in the old days, we would use a highlighter. So from an analog standpoint, we'd go through the book. If we read something that we wanted to remember, we'd highlight it and then we'd bring that into our note system. We can do the same thing in a digital way by using pen scanners. So here I have a couple of pen scanners from a company called New Yes. I did an entire review on this older scanner. It's, it's one of my older videos, so you'll have to dig for that one. But I'll be making a new video on the, the new AI powered pen scanner where I talk about all of the features, things like uh, doing highlighting, translating, recording, even as a camera built into it. Stay tuned for that video. But for this video, the key element of this is that I can go through and I can highlight text in a book and I can then have that text stored on this device or I can actually have it in real time transfer onto my phone so that I can actually have whatever I'm scanning immediately digitized on my phone, pull quotes from a book and then take it on my phone, put it into my note system, 
put it into AI. This actually has AI built into it as well. There's a number of features this has. Again, I'll do an entire review video on this, but for, for scanning in terms of research and just grabbing information, this is a great way to digitize the text that's printed in a book into a frictionless way uh, into my phone and then on, down to my research system. The other thing that's really nice about this is it also is distraction free. That's maybe another video, maybe that's part of the review video, but one of the challenges is that if we wanna have students do research, if we wanna have students working with uh, digital assets, we wanna to try to, whenever possible, assist them, if you would, with their focus by not giving them tools that have a lot of additional elements. So a good example is on my school group. So I have a school group where we talk about a lot of this stuff in more depth, and I'll put a link to the school group down below. But one of my members of my school group was talking about how um, in Europe, in Denmark, they're actually looking at going um, analog. So they're actually not using a lot of digital tools like phones because they find, found that students were too distracted by them and they were having what I would call um, non-beneficial screen time. I personally think that that might be an extreme position to bounce between analog and digital. I think the right type of intentional technology can assist those students in learning. And this just might be something that can have some intentionality to it if all we're doing is translating, defining terms, highlighting text. Anyways, I'll make a video on this. But meanwhile, we can use that pen level translation to get very narrow, just take quotes that I want from the book that I want, and I can now have that captured in my system. So far we've talked about how we can take analog information and we can convert it into a digital format. But what if I want to work in an analog environment? I want to use paper and I want to use a pen with ink and I want to be able to write things, I want to be able to take notes, I could have post-it notes, I could have a notebook, I could have a little journal and I want to be able to take that information and I want to be able to digitize it. Well, that's where this pen comes into play. This is a LiveScribe Smart Pen. It has ink in it, but it also has a small camera that allows me to pick up on little dots on this paper and everything becomes digitized. I don't notice it, I just write as I would with any pen, but it's stored on the pen or directly transferred onto my phone, either in real time or at a later date with synchronization, and it allows me to use a pen and paper environment, but still immediately have that available to me as a digital asset. Again, I've made an entire video on this pen and I will link it below as well. I owe you a lot of links down below, but I, will, I, I made an entire video where I talk about the pen, but this is yet another way that I can work in a digital analog environment, but this time I work analog back to digital as opposed to analog converted to digital. So that's another tool that we can use. Now that we've seen some of the ways that we can work with analog and digital, the really important question is to ask ourselves, how does this affect the way that I learn and teach? It's these types of conversations that we do have in the school community, where we have the ability to go back and forth, have a little bit of a deeper conversation around these things, and I'll certainly be making more videos on these topics. You know, there's a lot of difference in these tools. Having a high fidelity scan, it has its purpose. Grabbing a few lines from a book, it has its purpose. Doing an OCR on an entire book to enable search, that has its purpose. There isn't any one solution that matches every need, but we can see that different tools can help us in an overall system. And the goal is not to go paperless. Um, you know, I love books, I love the tactile feel of a book, I like reading, there's something to be said about how relaxing it is. I mean, I'm even into vinyl, so I have a lot of my favorite music I still keep on, on records instead of having everything digital. So I'm not advocating that everything should be digital, but when it comes to a research workflow, digital facilitates better working with the data, better analysis of the data, because we can start bringing things like AI to help explain what a diagram is, to help us explain or synthesize some of the information. We still bring our brains into the equation, but we can use tools that will allow us to do things 
just a little faster, maybe with a little bit more fidelity in terms of understanding. There's, those are other videos that we can have here on the channel. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked the video, hit the like as always. Uh, you can, there's all sorts of buttons down there. Go explore the buttons down there. There's a like button. There's a button where you can share the video. There's lots of cool stuff below this video. And the links. I make sure that I'll put all those links that I promised you throughout the video. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time.